When I was a newspaper reporter in the local bureau of a capital city paper, I lived in fear up till 9.30 every night when I was the reporting. Why? Because my editor had to file stories at 9.30, so I was unlikely to get a call after that, a fact-checking call. There were no pleasantries on these calls, just a curt voice telling me that something was being fact-checked. He was so biting, my editor, that the reporters had made a verb out of his last name. And the verb meant something like slicing and dicing and reducing to nothing. We would ask each other, did you get, using the verb, last night? And we would share and commiserate. Now, I hope today that he's out there somewhere, plying his craft because fact-checking seems like kind of a sacrament in the world in which we live today. I remember in 2015 or so when I first heard a public figure making bold claims that were much distanced from the facts that I knew. I was shocked, but I was also okay with it. People will see through this, I thought. And then we had an election and it became more prevalent. My fact-checking self kept saying, there, 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 this will pass soon, soon. And then there was a pandemic and people were dying because of statements that weren't true. And my inner journalist was getting, you know, a little mm, agitated at this point. And then we had another election and an insurrection and people were not seeing through it. And I no longer could be a truth denying denier. One of my impetuses for talking about this subject today is my realization this summer that I am no longer shocked or even surprised at blatantly false statements. They're just part of our world today. We see them all the time. In fact, they're more common than mud here in our dry area of the world. False news is not new, as people who have been shunted to the margins of our society already know. However, its exponential rise is headline and study worthy, and there are many, many people in many, many fields, including journalism and psychology, studying to find out why this is happening right now. In Psychology Today, one author, a cognitive neuroscientist, points out that not only is there a rise in conspiracy theories and other forms of false news, to make worse, he says, those peddling fake news have accused relatively legitimate media channels of being the source of false information, confusing people about what they need to know. The article concludes, that the rise in stress and anxiety has made people much more susceptible to false news. In a faith where, as I've said, the search for truth and meaning has a basic principle and has been for over 40 years, this seems a worthy focus for today. Not only does this rise of epidemic of false news threaten our world and our public life, it is also leading to more personal division and isolation and despair. This is happening in part because misinformation leads us to act as a society. The American Civil Liberties Union is tracking 506 bills they label as anti-LBGTQ, with many of them aimed at restricting the rights of transgender people. False news has many implications, confusion, Risky decision-making, bad decision-making. It's also tied to the rise of extremism. And it makes sense that it is tied to the vulnerability caused by stress. This natural tendency, Alcarian says, to accept false news as a face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary is a psychological phenomenon known as confirmation bias and it's found often in individuals suffering from anxiety who see the world as a dangerous place which makes them defensive and less open to the information they find threatening. Now, a source I find credible is the Pew Foundation research. Their study in 2014, before things got worse, found that already there was a lot of partisan animosity and that it was growing, and that increasingly there was more participation in public in public dialogue by people at what they called the U-shaped pattern with higher levels of engagement on the right and the left of the ideological spectrum and lower levels in the center. Here's the thing though, false news 
continues to endanger us in these times. And as I was looking for credible sources for this discussion, because it seemed like a really good one to check my facts on, as I do every time, but this one in particular, an article in Nature Journal caught my eye, and it documented what many are saying, that false news has absolutely nothing to do with facts or countering facts. It has everything to do with feelings, especially fear and anxiety and isolation. Too many of us have entered in with the best of intentions into discussions with people we truly love who are under the grip of false news with a whole quiver full of facts hitting the bullseye one and again and again and again only to have each arrow make its target and then bounce off to lie on the ground unnoticed. So how do we interrupt this cycle? First, I would suggest with ourself by making sure that in our own stress and anxiety, what we are passing on in our conversations is informed. To get our information from a variety of sources, there is an easy way that we tend to blame social media for everything now. And yes, social media can increase the kind of media of kind of identity flocking that can keep this and, and grow this. But we cannot blame this all on social media, which has actually, in some cases, brought more information. We are in the grips of forms of artificial intelligence that mean it's more easy to create realistic depictions of people saying things they never said. And yet, the question is, where are we getting our information? We need to think about that. If we are in here, let's say, an MSNBC watcher, I'm not asking you to go watch Fox News. I'm asking you to perhaps check out CNN sometimes as well. If you're getting your news only from TikTok, I'm suggesting you look for some other sources. And if you only read the New York Times, maybe you want to go on social media and see what they're saying there. It's just important that we do that. And then when we make a mistake, as we all will do, that we correct it wherever we made it. Perhaps, if the root is fear and anxiety, most important is our own spiritual care. And if that word makes you rankle from some kind of way, then what I want to say, what I mean by it in this particular time, is to care for that which sustains the spark of life and curiosity in us when we feel overwhelmed. There are places and things you can do in this very community that in this particular season, in this particular world, I hope you will consider, like Vespers and Breath and Spirit and our community dinner this week, like our harvest meal two Fridays from now, like singing for, with the choir for the holidays, like coming and sitting and talking with somebody about a concern you have at our Justice Sunday, just making connections. It really matters. As individuals, we can't stop the proliferation of false news and the sticky, sticky problems like the one Sharon put it for before us, the one she put before us. But what we can do is remember that we have agency to control what we do in our own lives. May our inner peace and our continued actions for a more truth-holding world guide our words in these troubled times. <laughs>